So hopefully you have started assembling your ensemble. You've got your strings in your session of whatever your DAW is. You've got your brass, you've got your percussion, you've got your winds, you've got synths and a little bit of sound design. The ensemble is coming together. And this is the place that I was at when I learned the next part of this lesson about templates. Um, I was in my second year of college. I was taking some lessons in orchestration from an amazing orchestrator who's worked on Spider-Man 3 and Fantastic Four, Rise of the Silver Surfer. And um, I'd been taking a couple lessons with him and I had sent him one of my mock-ups and he says, yeah, this is, this is really good, but uh, your orchestra kind of lacks dimension. And I kind of said, well, what do you mean by that? And he said, well, for one, your, your violins are coming out of the right speaker. And I kind of had to just cover my face in embarrassment because, I mean, if we think about it, right? And please refer to the, to the panning and reverb companion in, in the uh, supplementary course materials. But if we think about it, on the left side of the stage is where the violins belong, right? And on onward as we go, we get second violins, we get violas, we get cello, and then contrabasses off to the side. So ideally, when we're doing our own mock-up, we are also going to create the sonic illusion that the orchestra is laid out this way, especially if we're dealing with samples, right? So he suggested that I actually start panning out some of my samples, which I ended up doing, and it added so much dimension. Now we're gonna discuss how to add dimension not only left to right, sorry, it's reversed here because of the camera, it, for you, left to right, but also we're going to learn how to create dimension in terms of adding reverb and adding space and adding dimension in terms of distance. So let's hop over to the computer and see how we can create more dimension and more depth with our template and with our orchestral mockups by integrating panning and reverb. All right, you guys, welcome back to our Logic Pro template in which we are going to talk about reverb and panning. Now, reverb and panning are important for kind of three primary reasons. Number one, it's going to lend greater authenticity to our samples. It's gonna make them sound more real. Number two, it's gonna give us greater dimension. Dimension in terms of reverb being closeness, uh, if it's a really dry sound, meaning that it doesn't have a lot of reverb, or distance if we've made it uh, really reverberant and added a lot of reverb. It's going to feel farther away. And then dimension also in terms of left to right being the stereo image of what we're experiencing. So dimension kind of in those two primary ways. The third reason that reverb and panning are important is to lend a sense of space and place. Where are we? Are we in a concert hall? Are we in the mountains? You know, it's going to lend a, a little bit more sonic information to uh to the musical picture we're trying to create. So as a starting point, let's go ahead and open that panning and reverb companion in the course materials. All right, here again, we see this familiar panning diagram. On the left-hand side of the string section, we have our first violins panned somewhere in the neighborhood of negative nine. Our second violins, just above them, they're panned at around negative seven left of center. Our violas are gonna be around a plus seven right of center. And our cellos and basses are gonna be panned a little bit farther off to the right-hand side at plus nine and plus 11, respectively. Woodwinds and percussion, those guys are gonna be more or less in the middle. Horns on the left-hand side, we're gonna pan them a little bit left of center at negative eight. And trumpets and bones and the rest of our brass are often gonna be panned off to the right side, somewhere around plus five. And you again, guys, these are not hard and fast rules. Given the sample libraries that I own, this is the rough panning placement that I have used. The rule is season to taste. Compare it with some real orchestral recordings, see how it sounds, and tailor your sound for the libraries that you end up having in your template. So let's go ahead and lend a little bit of additional context here. 
So this is how we might go about integrating some of those panning values. So for example, if I go to my trumpets in my template, I can see that they're somewhere in around the neighborhood of plus five, which matches exactly what was on that panning diagram. If I go to my horns, they're right around, you know, a negative eight, which is pretty close to what we had on the panning diagram as well. I would do the same thing with my strings, same thing with my woodwinds, same thing with my percussion. And you guys, to illustrate how important this is, I want to go ahead and show you a little bit of an example. I have two recordings here, one of which has uh, reverb added and all the instruments have been panned. I also include some of the EQ and compression effects that I had showed you in our last lesson where we went through the template together. Now, another one of the examples, I'm not going to tell you which, has no panning, no reverb, and none of those additional effects. And you're going to notice that that recording sounds so much more flat and unidimensional, and it really lacks that sense of space. So let's go ahead and listen to both of these, and I want to see if you can tell the difference between which one is which. Let's take a listen to this first one. So that's the first one. Let's go ahead and take a listen to this second one. And folks, I really don't think it's uh, that hard to tell the difference between the two. Clearly, our first example here was the example that had the panning implemented, that had the reverb, and had the additional effects. Again, I can't stress this enough. Even though samples are recorded beautifully by great engineers, more often than not, that's the case at least, we still want to add additional effects to get that extra 10, 20% of listening experience out of our samples. So to illustrate this even a little bit more, let's talk about reverb. Now, there are like really three different reasons we wanna examine our reverb. So it's not, of course, only for the additional realism, but it's also for a sense of space and mood. Different reverbs are going to convey different geographic locations. I mean, are we indoors? Are we outdoors? Is it a big space? Is it a small space? Is it dead? Like, is it not very resonant or reverberant or is it really reflective? You know, the reverb is going to really help convey that type of space and give the listener a sense of orientation about where they are. Um, the second thing it's going to do for us is convey mood. You know, if it's really small and really dry, we might feel kind of closed in. If it's very big and ethereal, that might feel more mysterious. And the third thing that reverb is going to do for us is, again, provide a sense of distance from the listener. If the reverb is really big, we're going to feel farther away. If it's really dry and tight, we're going to feel like we're much, much closer to the listener. 
to convey that, I'm going to be playing a couple of lines on this instrument here. This is what's called a Laotian reed flute. I actually found this while I was at the Hmong Independence Festival um, with my wife, and it's just got kind of a really neat, unique sound. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to record a line, and we're going to play it through three different reverbs that you can kind of see on my template here. This first one is no reverb. It's just going to be dry. This second... Uh, track that you see here is a hall reverb, sort of as if we were on the scoring stage. And then this third reverb down here is sort of a larger than life mountain type reverb. So again, you're going to get a better idea of how reverb can convey, um, you know, the type of space that we're in, the mood, and also the perceived distance from the listener. Let's give this a try. So again, you can really hear the difference between no reverb, sort of a hall type reverb and sort of an outdoor, larger than life, you know, mountainscape almost type reverb. All give a very different sense of the type of space that we're in, the mood that we're trying to convey, and maybe how far away our perceived distance is from the listener. Mm -hmm. 